What's going on everyone? It's Stratus here back with another video and today we are going to be talking about harmonic frequencies. Um, and the basis of this video is going to be trying to cover kind of what are harmonic frequencies, um, what you need to do to kind of understand how they work and how you can use them to make your own sounds and how you can utilize them in your own sound design. Make sure you drop a like on this video, uh, make sure you subscribe if you want to see more Stratus content, and let's get into the video. So say you have two different sounds. Let's just pull up a couple of sounds here uh, and we're going to compare them. And we're going to do a little experiment here. Okay, let's pull up a flex. Two different VSTs, completely different how they work. Uh, this one is um, like real life samples. This is all synthesizers and, and whatnot. But if I play a middle C here, that sounds like a middle C. Okay, now let's go to middle C on labs. And it's the same note. That's not surprising. But what is kind of surprising, maybe not, is that they sound completely different. Now, the fundamental frequency is the same, but the notes sound vastly different. One sounds like a guitar and one sounds like a synth. And you might be asking yourself like, hmm, why is that? And that's all to do with the harmonic frequencies. So I'm going to do a little bit more of an in-depth dive into how these harmonic frequencies actually change the sound and why they changed the sound. So to understand a little bit more about these harmonic frequencies, I'm going to open up Serum. Now you can use pretty much any uh, VST that allows you to change the frequencies or the um, harmonics of a sound. And to start off, we're just going to go into this menu here, and you might have seen this menu in a few of my other videos, but basically what it is, is it's just the oscillator table editor. So you can change the harmonic frequencies of your sound. So what I'm going to do here is clear all, and then I'm going to draw in one harmonic frequency, and that's going to be our fundamental. So when I play a middle C, it plays one single harmonic, and that's the fundamental. You might have some basic knowledge of harmonic frequencies, and if you do, then you know that it's like the resonant frequency of whatever instrument you're playing. In this case, it's a synthesizer, so it's a little bit different. But uh, if, you, if you're familiar with harmonic frequencies, then you know the second harmonic is one octave of above the first. So you can hear this. If this is a C5, then this would be C6, one octave above. Now the third bin is three oscillations higher. And then the fourth bin, believe it or not, four oscillations higher, five, six, seven, eight. So you can see each harmonic is one more oscillation than the last one. So this would be playing on every single octave of the sound on these bins and you, they go up by powers of two. So that's just playing a C on every octave um, and that's not a very cool sound. It sounds a little bit weird. So now that we kind of understand exactly what these harmonics are, why don't we look at some of the more common shapes that you would use. So this is a sawtooth wave and you can see that the harmonic frequencies are positioned something like this. And this wave is gonna sound like this, like so. But if we open up a second oscillator, we go to some default shapes, we see a sine wave and this is an analog sine wave, so it has a little bit of noise in there, uh, which just basically means that it's not a perfect sine wave. Um, and usually you would uh, have some analog sine wave if you're using uh, analog synth, which is not able to perfectly replicate a sine wave. So that's why you get some of this, this resonant noise. Um, but typically, if you're using a digital sine wave, it would look just like this. Uh, there would be no uh, harmonic noise here. It would just be one fundamental frequency. And then if we go to basic shapes here, we can see this is the digital sine wave, like so. And then we can see this sawtooth wave, which is, is actually very similar to uh, this sawtooth wave, except you can see these ones have harmonics that are out of phase. And this bin lower before uh, these bins are actually just the, um, the, the phases of each bin. So if I like edit the phases, you can see how it changes. So very similar in that way. Uh, the harmonics are all the same. It's just the way that the bins are orientated. So you can see that's kind of similar, like so. Okay, and then if we go over to something like a square wave, or uh, sorry, a triangle wave, and we can see something interesting here. Uh, we have each harmonic separated by one that's either on or off. So since we can see that this has every single harmonic frequency, well, this only has half of the harmonic frequencies, if we play the triangle wave, it sounds a lot thinner than if we were playing a sawtooth wave. 
so you can kind of understand what gives each sound its tonality. It might be its harmonic density or the harmonics amplitude. It depends where the harmonics are. For example, if I were to add more harmonics here and then have none of the higher harmonics, we wouldn't have any of that high end. We'd mostly have mids and lows. So I guess what the takeaway from that is that pretty much harmonics, all they are is a bunch of sine waves. Every sound that you hear is a combination of strategically placed sine waves, which is just kind of interesting. Like something that's very harsh and very not sine wave like is actually just a combination of sine waves. Um, so do with that what you will. Um, that's not the most important thing to take away from it, but it is something interesting nevertheless. So when it comes to making a song, what are good sounds to use and what are bad sounds to use? Well, it kind of depends on what you're trying to achieve. So if you want a really powerful sound that fills up the frequency spectrum, then you want to have something with a bunch of harmonics. So something like a synthesizer using, you know, a super saw, for example. A super saw is going to have a wide range of harmonics and it's going to fill up the entire frequency spectrum. But if you want something that cuts through the mix and something like a melody or something like that, you want to use something that has very sharp peaky harmonics and that way it will cut through the mix and you can hear it no matter what amplitude the sound is at. For example, something like a vocal. Vocals have very, very high frequency uh, pitches. So if we look at the EQ spectrum here. We can see that there's a lot of very peaky harmonics. And that's what's very good about vocals, and that's why vocals are so heavily utilized, because vocals really cut through the mix no matter what level you're playing them at. Even if it's pretty low in the mix, they can still be heard because they're relatively high pitched and the harmonic frequencies really just cut through the mix. That brings me to my next point. What do you think the best wave is to use for a sub bass? All right, I'm gonna give you a few seconds to answer that. And if you said sign, then, you're wrong. I'm gonna play two sub basses for you and I want you to tell me which one sounds heavier. So I have two oscillators here and they're both being low passed, but first of all, let's, uh, let's just start with the sine wave. That's what the sine wave sounds like by itself. Okay, and now we're gonna add the sawtooth wave. You can hear that it fills up a lot more of the frequency spectrum while staying in the sub range. And you can hear that since it has those more harmonic frequencies, it's a lot more present and you could hear it a lot better. Once again. So when you're designing a sub bass, rather than just using a sine wave like so, you can actually low pass something like a sawtooth wave. In fact, this is actually the method that I use to create my sub basses. And this is one of the subs that I use. This is a preset. And it sounds very, very hard. And you can see that there's uh, frequencies going all the way to the mid-range. And the fundamental is obviously on the sub, but there are harmonic frequencies that go past bass into the mids. You can kind of also experiment with what sounds good when it comes to sub basses. So for example here, I just drew in some random frequencies, kind of filled up these bins here. And then you can play with this asymmetric knob here kind of turn it until you find that pitch where the where the sub is just hidden like right here seems to be the sweet spot and if we look at the parametric EQ here you can see that the actual fundamental is not the loudest harmonic being played in fact it's the second harmonic that's the loudest which is just kind of interesting and this is kind of cool as well so what happens if we just take the fundamental out so now we don't even hear the fundamental, but the note didn't change. It still sounds like the same note. Why does it still sound like the same note even though we took out the fundamental? So this is really cool. It's a psychological effect called the restoration of the missing fundamental. So uh, if you do a quick Google search here, we can read this off. This phenomenon is called the restoration of the, fun the missing fundamental. The brain appears to have innate natural ability to create harmony. Again, this is not something we just found in the brains of trained musicians. This happens in everyone, instinctively, regardless of whether or not they play music at all. So, what we can entail from this is that, regardless if the fundamental frequency is present in the mix, we can still perceive the fundamental frequency. 
And this goes into kind of how you want to sound design when you're expecting someone to listen to your music on their phone, for example. If I bring something up on my phone, let's just play a song, uh, and you're not going to be able to hear any of the basses. So, mind you, there is no sub bass in this song. But if you listen to it, right here, there's very clearly a bass going on, regardless of whether the sub is actually present in the mix. And this is very important because that teaches us that we can actually create a sub note on a speaker that doesn't even produce sub notes. So when you keep that in mind and you're actually making a song, that's something that you want to kind of, you know, keep in your back pocket. Because when you're producing a sub, you don't want your sub to just be the sub, right? Because and say this person that listens to your songs regularly only uses headphones, you know, they can very clearly hear the sub, but they're like, hey, yo, check out this this new and up and coming artist I just found. L listen to their song and they play it for their friend and their friend's like, the shit is ass. There's no bass in this. Well, the reason why there's no bass is because you were using a sine wave as a sub. Uh, and that might sound good on headphones when, you know, sub notes are very easily replicated, but not on phone speakers where there is no sub notes. So by using these extra harmonics, you can actually formulate a sub note that is easily heard on phone speakers. To add on to this, there are some speakers out there that do not go below 20 hertz. That might be fine if the speakers that you're listening to are able to produce 20 hertz, but some speakers aren't able to produce 20 hertz. So to kind of replicate what a speaker might sound like if it can't produce, like say below 50 hertz. And we're playing, you know, a root note. So this is an E, right? This isn't even that deep of a note. This is just an E. But since we can't hear below 50 hertz on our speakers, we don't hear anything. This note is invisible to us. Although you can obviously see that there's a note being played, we can't hear it. But if we use the method that we previously used, we can very clearly now hear that note, even though it's being played out of the speaker's range. And this is very cool because that means that no matter what speakers you're playing it on, it's still gonna be perceived the same, even though the replication that the speaker is, is creating isn't exactly the same as how you hear it in your headphones. This kind of brings me to my next point, which is harmonic density. So the difference between these two things is one is not harmonically dense. For example, it only has a fundamental. That's a sine wave, and that's why we can't hear it. But something that is harmonically dense is a sub bass that we can hear on all speaker types. And that just means that it has a lot more harmonic frequencies. So say we have something that isn't harmonically dense, like a sine wave, and we're trying to make a pluck. So we have this pluck sample here. Uh, we're just going to make a little pluck right here. Uh, and it just goes something like this, where we have something very simple like this. And we're like, wow, this is not very swag. This is actually very weak in the mix, but I want to make it harder. What can I do to add more harmonic frequencies? Well, one thing you can do is add distortion. So if we look at the difference here between having harmonic frequencies versus not, we can see it's highlighting a bunch more harmonics here versus if we didn't have the distortion when we only have the fundamental. So by adding distortion here, we can add a lot more harmonic density and therefore add a sound that is a lot more present in the mix, like so. And we can actually modulate this drive as well in order to create a more plucky sound. And then we can add something like multiband compression, which is going to bring out those higher harmonic frequencies a little bit more, like so. And you can see that these harmonic frequencies that are a little bit higher on the frequency spectrum end up increasing in volume. Let's say we don't want any of this bass tone. It's a pluck. Well, we can use the same phenomenon, the restoration of the fundamental frequency, and cut out the fundamental. And we can still perceive this we can still hear that it is the same note being played regardless if the fundamental is present. By utilizing the harmonic density of this new sound that we can create, we can basically create space for the lower bass tones and we can separate the high end out while keeping the same notes. So I hope you learned something within this video. I know it's a lot and I know it's a little bit more techy than my other types of videos, but regardless, I hope you learned something new. And if you wanna make sure you catch up on my newest videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that like button once again, and I will see you in the next video.